fantastic. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our uh, online lecture series from the Cape Cod Maritime Museum. We're very happy to have you here with us today. My name is Abigail. I'm from uh, the museum, and I'm the museum's program associate. It's important to note that programs like this uh, are made possible by support from looks like everyone here, and we urge you to consider donating or becoming a member. Uh, your support helps us hold programs like this and others. Please consider donating and help keep the programs going. Uh, before we get started, just a few reminders about our Zoom lecture format. Please be sure that your microphones and videos are off so that all our attention can be on the speaker. If you run into technical issues, please send me a message via the chat function. Also, if you have a question for today's speaker, you can type that in our Q&A option or in the chat and we'll read them at the end. Our speaker will be taking the questions at the end and you can type your questions at any point during the talk. Um, and we're very happy to welcome Julia Branch, uh, the Learning Engagement and Engagement Officer from the Scottish Fisheries Museum in Anthrusher, Scotland. And thank you very much for coming today. No, no, thank you for having me. Um, I hope everyone's going to enjoy just having a brief overview about who we are and what we do here in uh, the Fisheries Museum. So um, I am responsible for our public facing programs at the museum. So that's our workshops for schools, our events, for children, adults and families, and coming to talk to people like you guys about the stuff that we do. So it's a really important part of what we do because we have an incredible collection here in Anstruther and it tells some amazing stories about Scottish history that we want to share with local people, but also with the wider world as well. So I've been working in the heritage sector in Scotland for just over 10 years now. Um, and I actually started my museum journey as a volunteer uh, with a learning department at a museum in England. So um, I love sharing my passion for the past with people. So I'm really happy to be here talking to you today. I've only been at the Fisheries Museum for about a year now. Um, so I'm, I knew absolutely nothing about fishing when I started. And I'm still I'm still learning as I go along. So every day I feel is still a school day because I'm still learning. So to start off with, I just thought to tell you a bit about the museum itself. It opened in 1969 and it's run as an independent charitable trust. And we collect and preserve items that relate to all aspects of the Scottish fishing industry across the whole of Scotland. We are supported, we are a national museum um, and we receive some funding from the Scottish Government and also from our local council. And we're also supported by Museum Gallery Scotland, which is the Scottish body that supports museums um, that's associated with the government. So the funding that we get from these bodies actually is only a small percentage of our actual income. Most of our income actually comes from admissions through our shop sales and through our tea room. The main purpose for our museum is to research and interpret uh, the history of Scottish fishing industry um, through our displays, our exhibitions, um, and through publications and events, uh, like coming to talk to you guys virtually today. So the history of fishing in Scotland has been connected to boats, fish, and folk for at least the past 700 years. Um, social and economic changes like the Industrial Revolution and increasing political intervention in the industry um, has actually kind of led to this development of a commercial fishing industry. And the whole reason that the museum actually came into being back in the 1960s was to recognise that this industry was changing and there was a danger that this way of life, the history was actually going to be lost because of the techn technological um, improvements that were happening. So that's why we exist. Um, we sit on the lovely harbour front in Anstruther in Fife. Um, the building on the right, the white building that goes into this kind of round stone, that's the kind of corner of the museum site. We actually cover over 27,000 square foot, so we are quite a large site. We look very small from the outside, and all our visitors say, you're like TARDIS. There's so much to see here. You're so big. 
um, we didn't realize it. So, you know, that is kind of our big kind of selling point. And the number of times I actually say to people, we're a lot bigger on the inside, but it's true. We have, we are quite a big site. Um, the site that we're on has actually been associated with fishing from the 14th century as well. So it's nice to actually have that connection within the building itself, as well as us being the museum telling this story. We have 21 historic vessels in our collection, um, two of which are actually sitting in the harbour here. Uh, the one right in front of you that you can see, the black one with the two masts, that's um, our flagship, the Reaper, which I'll tell you more about in a little while. Um, and to the right of that, there's a smaller boat with a bit of blue on it, and that's uh, our boat, White Wing. So we actually have two boats in our collection. They're accessioned, but they're actually seaworthy vessels that do go out and do outreach, which is pretty cool. So the museum has uh, 10 gallery spaces. Most of them um, are arranged around this historic courtyard that's the centre of the museum. And the buildings around the courtyard date from between the 16th and the 19th century. Um, so this courtyard itself um, has been part, what I've already said, since the 14th century, this site has been associated with fishing. Um, but this was land originally gifted by uh, the Laird of Anstruther, uh, William de Candle, to the abbot um, of Balmory in North Fife um, in 1318. And the abbot leased this land to the local people here in Anstruther so they could sell, cure their fish and also dry and repair their gear and bark their nets, which would prevent them from being rotting uh, away. So the kind of wooden structure that you can see in front of the white building here is actually one of the structures that they used to put their nets over to dry them. So that's a nice kind of other kind of feature of the courtyard. It's kind of a historic site in itself, but it helps us tell this really interesting story. So over the years, um, like I said, we've, we're now at 27 square footage. We're quite a big site. Um, but so we have, we were quite small originally and we've just accumulated more and more buildings. And one of these more later additions uh, was a form of fisherman's cottage, which is in the corner here. Um, and this shows visitors what a fisherman's family home would have looked like in the 19th century. So the downstairs, we've got the actual living space and area. And then the upstairs is the garret or the net loft. And that's where they actually stored all their gear. Um, so I think it's quite a nice space because people can contrast like what our lives are like today and what lives were like in the past. Um, one of the things I often get asked by school kids is like, well, how do they go to the toilet? What do they, <laughs> what do they do? Um, and in Anstruther, a lot of the fishermen were actually quite wealthy. So they actually had small little outhouses, but um, places where people were, it was a smaller fishing community, obviously they might be using a chamber pot or something similar. So, you know, I, I, I just love telling that to kids. They're just like, how, how do they go to the toilet? Okay. This is how. Another addition uh, to the museum in the 1990s um, was our historic boat building yard. Um, and this is where we display most of our historic boat collection. This site was formerly um, the Smith and Hutton boat building yard. And it's quite nice to be able to tell the story of boat building in this space that used to be used uh, to make them. So this gallery explores the different variations in boat designs through the boats in our collection that have come from all the way across Scotland and were used for different types of fishing as well. So we have like a salmon cobbler, uh, we have like ring, a ring net boat um, and they're all very different. So we are one of Scotland's national industrial museum. Our collection consists of over 66,000 objects. Um, and this ranges from our actual vessels to model boats, to fishing gear. We also have a lot of paintings in our collection as well, um, and an archive and photographs. We also have an extensive social history collection, which includes like personal possessions, 
textiles like ganzies, which were the jumpers that the fishermen would have worn, um, and other objects to do with the home, including a chamber pot or two. So one part of our collection is actually the Buckland collection. Um, and Frank Buckland, this lovely gentleman that you see here, he was a Victorian naturalist and an inspector of fisheries. And he actually started the first museum that looked at the history of fish and sea life, which was actually in London in Kew. Um, and basically we have a small part of the collection that he originally had. So most of his items are actually plaster casts of different sea creatures and fish. We've only actually got about 40 specimens in our collection, but originally he had thousands of specimens, um, but it's just his museum after a while wasn't as well visited, so not all of them have survived, but we're really lucky to have a small collection of that within our space. So our flagship, the Reaper, um, that you would have seen in the picture on the harbour um, is one of three vessels that we have in our collection that are registered um, on the UK National Register of Historic Vessels. Um, and so they're basically seen as being significant both in Scotland but also in the wider UK. So the Reaper um, is basically a Fifey, which is the design of the ship. Um, and it was a herring drifter. So basically they fished for herring using drift nets. So they would go out to sea at night time. Um, they put their sails down, they put the drift net out and the herring would come up because the plankton would be up at the surface in the evening as the herring would follow the plankton and come into the nets. So slightly lost my drift of thought here. Give me a second. So the Fifey was actually the one of the most popular designs in the east nook of Fife and along the east coast of Scotland in the 19th and 20th centuries. And we're re really lucky to actually have this boat still going out and sailing at the moment. So herring was the most important fish uh, for the industry in Scotland during that same period. Um, and they were actually referred to as silver darlings by the fish folk themselves. So our boat, the Reaper, it's 70 feet long. Um, it was originally built in 1902. Um, she kept being used for fishing uh, right up into the First World War. Um, and she also saw action in World War II in the south of England. She was bought by the museum in 1975 and we restored her to kind of the condition that she would have been in, in 1902. So originally she had sails and then she was given an engine and we just transformed her back to being um, a sailing vessel. And she is looked after by our lovely boats club, some of whom that you'll see on board here. And they're the people that actually take the boat out. Um, they go around the country to different ports um, and engage local communities and school groups. Um, when I first went on it, after I first started working here, um, I didn't realise how short fishermen must have been because um, most of the boats club, they have to duck their heads when they're below deck. I don't have that problem, I'm quite short. So, um, you know, that's a bit of living history. You don't really realize these things until you're actually on a boat and actually you get the real feel, that immersive experience that you don't get when you're just looking at it on a display board in a museum. So I think we're really lucky that we have the opportunity to take this out for people to actually see what it was like for these people being out fishing. So our second boat of national significance is the research. Um, she is a Zulu style vessel. And this name for the boat design probably came um, because this boat 
appeared and originated during the period of the Zulu Wars. Um, so that's kind of where we think the name came from. So I already mentioned the Fifi. Um, so the Zulu was basically, I, I like to describe it as this was the super boat. Um, because we had the two really popular boat designs in Fife, which was the Fifey, which was a really fast boat. And we also had the Scappy, um, which was a very maneuverable boat. And basically someone decided to bring the elements of design of these two boats together to have a boat that was both fast and maneuverable. So like I said, I like to think this is the super, super boat. Um, so this design of boat became really popular um, and it was being used across Scotland. The research was actually an active fishing vessel right up until 1968. Um, and at that point her skipper retired and um, quite soon after that, the museum um, acquired her. So the one other thing about this boat is that this is physically in the museum building. The gallery space that it's in was actually built around it. Um, so it's pretty impressive when people are walking around and they're like, how, how did you get this boat in? It's like, well, we built the building around it. That's how, that's how we got it in. So our third boat, um, which is significant, is the Lively Hope, which is a ring netter. And this means that she was involved um, in using the fishing method where shoals would be enveloped in a circular net. And it was a much more efficient way of fishing than small lines and drift nets, which were used by the reaper and the research. So she was built in 1936 um, and she was always used as a fishing vessel until we acquired her in 1995. So we did have to undertake some conservation work with her um, by re doing a bit of redecking um, and restoring her to her original state. Um, and it's it, again, this is like our third boat that's really important because there are no other boats that are to this standard as a ring netter or a boat that was actually, this was boat was specifically designed for this type of fishing. So that's why it's so important. So all these three boats, they show how changes which have occurred within the fishing industry, they, and they highlight how technologies have changed um, and how boat designs have altered with that. So the Reaper and the research show how traditional wooden vessels were adapted um, because they started out as sailboats and then they had engines fitted. Whereas the Lively Hope uh, represents the change towards boats being built for a specific purpose. So to be a ring net, net fishing boat in the case of the Lively Hope. So I just wanna put this into a bit of perspective. So um, a single crew of 15 men on the Reaper or the research, they would catch more. So 15 men, so I'm gonna start that again. I'm getting my words the wrong way around. So. A crew of 15 men on a more modern boat nowadays, within 90 days, they would actually catch more fish than 500 boats would have in the 19th century. And that gives you the perspective of how different this industry is today. So we went from having tens of thousands of fishing boats across Scotland to having only about 20,000. No, 2,000. Two Get my words muddled. 2,000. 2,000 boats today. Apologies and getting myself tied in knots today. <laughs> but basically, the point is the impact of industrialization and technology evolving that this has had on this community, you know, on this industry. But it's also had an impact on the community associated with that industry. Because Anstruther itself, we are a fishing town. That's how we started out. We now no, have no fishing boats coming out of Anstruther. We are, our main kind of income is tourism. And it's the same for a lot of towns across Fife in our local area in Scotland, that there has been this massive move away from this industry just because of how technology has changed. 
And that's why it's so important because the museum is here to tell, tell the story so it doesn't get lost. So one of my most favorite stories that we talk about in the museum um, is about the fisher lasses. And these women worked up and down the coast of Scotland. Um, initially, they went out to gather mussels um, and they would actually bait the long lines and the small lines. So these were lines that were about a mile long they would have smaller lines coming off with a hook on the end. Um, and each of these hooks would need to be individually baited. So these girls would go out, they would collect the bait, they'd come back and they'd bait all the hooks. And it was a family affair, you know, it was the mothers, the daughters, even if the kids were old enough, they would be helping out as well. So it was very much a family business. When there was the move away from the long lines to the drift net, like would have been used on the reaper, it, that changed and we had the big herring boom. Um, and at this point, the fish lasses moved towards actually being on shore for when the fish were brought back in. So if we think about our boat, the reaper, it goes out to sea at night time. It comes back in probably about 5 a.m. in the morning and the women are there ready to start packing the fish so they would start they would be in groups of three as you'll see in this picture here and there'd be two girls that would be gutting the herring and then there'd be a girl who was a packer and she would be putting all the fish into the barrels um and at the kind of peak of the herring industry in scotland about six thousand women were actually traveling long distances following the fishing fleet around uh, Scotland's coast and down into England. Um, so that's a lot of women moving around. And these women actually have quite a lot of independence. You know, this is an opportunity to go away from home. Um, and people kind of think about in the 19th century, like women not having any agency, but these fisher lasses, they had a lot more agency than many women did at that time. And I feel that is a very important story to tell. So rumour has it that these fisher lasses could gut a fish a second. So they could gut 60 fish a minute. I personally don't think that's possible, but it's a nice idea. I think, you know, your hands would get so greasy and oily because herring is like a really oily fish. And you'll notice in the, in the painting here, they've got white um, bits of fabric around their fingers called clutes. And those were to protect their fingers from cutting, but it was also to kind of help them grip the fish as well, because you would be out there from the boats coming in at 5 a.m. You might still be there at midnight. That's how long your working day was. Um, so that's a lot of work and you're literally just cutting fish. Um, and they would sing songs to kind of help themselves keep going. But these women, they did have a lot more agency and independence than a lot of women in the 19th century. So like many museums, um, we draw on our local community for support um, in doing the work that we do. Uh, we have a national focus in our museum, but we're also a local museum as well because we are in a fishing town and that is the history that we've got here. And we have to get the balance right between telling this national story, but also supporting our local community. We are a very small team here of full-time and part-time staff um, and we couldn't do what we do without the support of our volunteers. Um, we have volunteers that actually work on site helping us deliver activities, care for our collection, do tours, um, but we also have volunteers that work off-site remotely um, and do some collections work for us that way. We also have three community clubs associated with the museum um, I already mentioned our boats club who look after the reaper, but we also have a rowing club um, and we also have a model boat club as well who are really keen on model boats and they will talk to you for hours about it if you let them. We also have our trustees who have great links to help support us in our work. 
And we also have partners nationally through the Industrial Museum Scotland Network and regionally in Fife and also local groups that we work with. And all this helps us create an engaging experience for our visitors. So the clubs I mentioned, um, our boat club, they are very keen at looking after the reaper, but they also actually try to support us in our vision of trying to keep these traditional boat building skills alive in Scotland. So um, within our historic boatyard, we actually have a workshop area, which the volunteer boat club work in. Um, this is fully visible from visitors in the gallery space. So visitors can't physically get into the workshop, but they can actually see in and see what the volunteers are up to. Um, and it's also this way of trying to keep these traditional skills that many of which are intangible. You know, we don't necessarily have written records of like, well, how did you make a clinker built boat? How did you make a carvel built boat? What were the techniques involved? Um, a lot of that was passed down orally. It wasn't written down. And this is our way of trying to actually keep that alive um, and keep that going. Um, even though our volunteer age is getting older, we're not getting many young people coming in, which is something that I really want to kind of try and encourage while I'm here. Um, but we have actually got one young volunteer who's just started working. It's, it's actually a really cool story. I'm going off on the tangent now, but um, yeah, we had a project and he came in to learn a bit more about what we were doing. And then he's like, you know what, actually, I want to come back and volunteer. So he's now our collections volunteer. But he also really enjoyed working with the Boats Club. And he dragged along his dad and his granddad. And we've now got three generations of a Fife fishing family volunteering for the museum, which is utterly amazing. And hopefully we'll get some more young people coming in as well. Um, another part of the museum space is we actually have a memorial room. And this is a space dedicated to those who have lost their lives at sea and have no memorial anywhere else. So anyone that's been lost at sea pre-1946, we have a book of remembrance. Anyone that's been lost after 1946, we have plaques around the wall for each individual boat or person. And anyone in Scotland who's lost someone at sea can request to have a plaque put in the space. Every year we have an annual um, remembrance service as well, which is led by one of the fishermen's missions. And this is, it's a small part of the museum, but I think it's a very important part because what is actually the real price of fish? You know, it's men's lives. It's still actually one of the most dangerous occupations that's out there. Um, and it's very important to the families who don't have anywhere to go to actually remember their loved ones. This is quite an important and poignant part of the museum. So engaging our visitors, I'm very briefly going to talk about some of the stuff that I do. Um, so one of my main things is to get school groups to come along to the museum or we can go along to them. I'm very keen for people to be able to get into character. Um, so we'll see this lovely girl on the left. She's being a fisher lass and trying to carry one of our big baskets on her back. Um, but also want kids to get hands on as well. So we do object handling on different topics within kind of the fishing in Scotland. And um, we also get school groups on top of the, on board the Reaper. So you'll see a group of school kids here. They're actually trying to raise the mast by pulling on the rope. So again, trying to get people to have these hands-on experiences that are a bit more immersive and actually give you a better feeling of like what it was like. So around the museum, uh, we have our friendly cat, Kipper. Um, and he is hidden around the museum all over the place. Um, we also have a hands-on activity in every gallery space. And he is there to basically be like, hi families, I'm a little fun thing for the kids to do, um, whether that's dressing up or trying to do some knot tying or something else. So um, he's kind of our little mascot and I really love him. I think he's really cute. 
also linked to him, we also have a maths trail as well for schools. So um, in Scotland, there's a week that's Maths Week Scotland and schools can come along at any time of year, not just that week and actually do a bit of maths around the collection, but following Kipper. Um, also, just on an anecdote, he's actually based on a story of a ghost cat that apparently is in the museum. So, you know, that's, he wasn't just like, oh, why have we got a Kipper cat? Well, actually, he's based on the ghost, because sometimes there's one part in the museum where you can actually feel a cat weave between your legs. But then we are, we are a lot of old buildings, so it's not a surprise, really. Another way we try and engage visitors, we try to get some funding for specific projects. Um, so recently in February, we had World Gaelic Week. So Scottish Gaelic, it's like the traditional um, language of Scots people. Um, and we were able to get some funding to do some events. So we did two events. We had a workshop um, and I had a lot of fun designing some guttable fabric fish which the kids got to come along and adults as well and have a go at gutting the fish and also trying to learn some Gaelic working songs, which would have been the songs sung by the fisher lasses while they were working. We also had a talk um, because there's someone who's actually doing a PhD thesis at the moment on these songs um, and she encouraged everyone to sing along. So hopefully this will work and you can actually hear the audience having a go at singing um, one of their songs. So that was the chorus, which is actually nonsense words. Um, the actual verses um, were very, like, um, there were a lot of innuendos in there. Um, uh, they the lasses used these songs as like a way of communicating and especially if they were following the fish around the coast and they were in England they could be singing in Gaelic and they could be being really rude about some of the local guys and they would have absolutely no idea because they couldn't understand what they were singing so it was it's a language of Scotland but with the fisher lasses the songs were also a part of their culture and own identity as well okay. yeah. There we go. Um, another project we did recently was Why Should I Care? Um, and this was aimed at young people at high school, trying to get them engaged in how we look after and care for our collections. So across a series of five workshops, we took them through the journey. Okay, what happens from the point that an object is donated to the museum? How do we like what's all the paperwork, all the boring stuff, because we had to do the boring stuff so we could do the fun stuff. And then how do we, what do we do to it? Do we need to clean it? How do we clean it? How do we care for these objects? How do we handle them? How do we store them? Or what happens to them when we put them on display? Um, so we did let them loose on some of our objects and let them clean them. And um, we also got them to clean one of our historic boats in the boatyard as well. And we were really lucky the boat club were really keen to be involved in this. So we actually had a day where they went along to the boat club and the boat club taught them some of these traditional skills. Um, not so that they'd be experts, but they got to have a go at a lot of different things. Um, and that's what you can see in the top right. Um, we're having a go at corking, which is putting um, between the slats of wood to stop anything kind of any water getting into your boat. That's the technique but I'm not an expert so don't ask me to explain any more than that. Um, this is a project that we actually have coming up soon which I'm really excited about which is why I'm telling you about it. Um, there's a new learning resource that's been created by Museum Gallery Scotland aimed at high schools and trying to engage them in what are the skills involved in the heritage sector because there are a lot of transferable skills that kids can gain that they can use in other areas of work life. So the learning resource is called Museum, and basically the synopsis is that the pupils are going to be creating the first museum on Mars. We're like 20 years in the future, there's a colony of humans on Mars, how are you going to tell the story of Earth to the people on Mars? So 
we're really lucky to be one of the pilot museums chosen to be involved in this project. And we're going to be working with a local high school and they're going to actually create a display in the museum about their bit of fishing history. Um, but I, I just love the fact that this learning resource is called Moseum. I don't know who came up with it, but I think it's brilliant. And I think the kids will really engage with it as well. So for the next part of um, my talk this, e well, this evening or this morning with you guys, this morning, the time difference <laughs> as a dimension to it. Um, so for this part, I thought I'd talk more about the kind of the customs, traditions and superstitions associated with Scottish fish folk. So fish has been recognised as a major food source for people around the world from the earliest times. And archaeologists in Scotland have found evidence of people settling in Scotland around 7,000 7, BC actually eating fish. So it's been around, it's been a food source for years. So within the fishing industry, life could be really tough um, for the men and women that are away. They were really tight knit communities um, developed because of this, because they had these shared hardships and dang the dangers that the fishermen faced as well. It's very different from people that were working in agriculture in land or people that were working in the factories. So they became really close, tight knit communities. Um, and perhaps because of the hazards of the occupation of going out to sea, um, they also had this kind of resilience within the communities and they had unique customs and kind of folklore. So it could come from like names, things that they ate and things that they did as a group, like the singing with the fish lasses, that's very unique to kind of them. Because of the dangers associated with um, the work of fishermen, they had a lot of superstitions. They were actually a very superstitious lot. And for example, there were some words that were seen as being really unlucky. So they never said the word minister. It was always the man in the black coat. Like words like rabbit or salmon or pig, they were all forbidden words. Um, and if men encountered particular animals on their way to go to the fishing boat, they'd be like, right, okay, we're not going to see because I've just walked past a pig or somebody said the word pig or swine. It's like, oh, right, we're not going to see today because that's bad luck. And if they actually found like a rabbit or a hare on board the boat, yeah, they definitely would not be going anywhere. And anecdotally, to kind of counteract the bad luck, if you touch cold iron, that was meant to kind of be like the opposite effect to neutralize it. And it's like, oh, it's all fine. But they were very superstitious. Um, I read one example of a local church where the minister was uh, reading, I think it was the prodigal son fable. Um, where he's looking after the pigs as part of the story. Um, and because he kept saying swine while he was reading it this out, the, the men kept on coughing. The fishermen were just like, oh. And then after like the fourth time of him saying the word swine, they all walked out and left the church because it was just like, this is really bad luck and we don't want it to rub off on us. So they, they were very superstitious. So a fisherman's fate in some of their minds was actually bound to their vessel. So it was very important that they gave it a good name. And they took name giving as very, very serious business. So names could be religious, traditional, poetic or humorous, but they always had some sort of significance. So biblical names um, are less common nowadays, but in the days of sail, when fishermen were kind of like, they were at the mercy of the elements, of the waves, the storms. Biblical names were a lot more common. And many of the names could actually be related to the beliefs of the particular owner of the boat as well. 
So for some votes, they might have a Masonic symbol like the one on screen here. And this affirmed the beliefs of the owner, but it also announced to other Masons in ports that they went to that they, they were Masons in their vote. So other biblical names, um, such as Brighter Hope, Lively Hope, Harvest, Gleaner, um, these names kept being combined with religious reference, but with this idea of hope that we're going to get a good catch when we go out today. Um, it was Latin names um, gave an air of class, which is a bit different. Uh, but again, it's like this name was expressing the hope that we're actually going to get a good catch when we go out. Um, and I just think this this painting is just quite beautiful of these Zulu boats out in the Firth. So many boats um, might be named after family owners, the families of the owners of the boat. So like a mother or a wife. Um, and sometimes that actually indicated that the wife actually, or the female family member actually had a share in the ownership of the boat. Um, so I already talked about women having a bit of agency. Um, a lot of the wives of fishermen, actually they controlled the money in the house in the 19th century. Um, you know, that they actually gave pocket money to their husbands and that was their money for the week. Um, and I was being told this, um, story by a visitor a couple of weeks ago how her father when her mum when her mum passed away um he didn't actually know how to go to the bank he didn't know how to write a check because his wife had done all of that for him all his life he just didn't he couldn't do with it she had to go deal with it for him because he'd never had to do it because the wife was in control of the purse strings in the household um so, but that was the same as it was in the 19th century, as it just coming into modern times. So, just going back to boat names. Um, so this boat here uh, was Gen Jeniska. So it's named after the daughters in this family, which were Jennifer, Isabel, and Catherine. So it wouldn't. Sometimes they might have been a bit greedy. I don't want to just name it after one person in my family. I want to name it after a couple of people. Um, but also some of these family members did actually have um, an ownership share in this boat as well. So I talked about the herring lasses and how they actually followed the fish around, they followed the fishing fleet around the coast of Scotland. So here we've actually got uh, this kind of map pointing out the different times of year that they went to the different areas across Scotland. So, um, you can see from in front of you, um, they started out kind of on the west coast and they would come around the top and down. Because basically when the herring industry was at its boom, we had these big herring shoals that moved all the way around the coast. So basically the fishing boats were following them going around. Um, and they ended up in East Anglia, which is actually where I'm from originally. So you'll see Lowestoft and Great Yarmouth down there. That's the area of the world that I used to be, whereas now I'm up in Scotland. So I, I kind of like that personal connection as well. So when boats returned home, especially from places like Yarmouth in East Anglia, um, if it had been a really good season and they'd made a lot of money, there'd be gifts for the family members when they came back up. And apparently, that if it was a good season, the return of the boats was actually more eagerly anticipated than Christmas, which I think is a really lovely thought. Um, so when telegrams were around, they would send a telegram to be like, oh, we're heading home. And the kids would be looking out of the net loft at the top being like, is the boat here yet? Is the boat here yet? Or they'd be sitting on the harbour walls just being like, is daddy home yet? Has he brought me something? Has it been a good season? So when the boats did come in, the harbour would be like a big bustle because there'd be the carts that would be carrying the gear and um, the kists, which were the, the kind of um, big chests that the fish and last girls kept their gear in. And so there'd be carts carrying everything back to people's houses. People actually knew what went where as well. So 
Um, and they also had like a pulley system. So they'd drop the gear off and the gear would get pulled back up into the loft. So you wouldn't have to do what we do nowadays, try and go up our stairs carrying awkward boxes. They would actually just pull it up. Why can't we go back to that? That would make life so much easier. <laughs> but it would be a really busy day. Um, and they'd also be starting to wash things as well and uh, trying to put the nets out for drying. So it'd be really busy and buzz buzzing. So it'd be a bit quiet when all the ships went away, but it would be so busy when everyone came back at the end of the season. So I already mentioned uh, the fisher lasses, but as well as the fisher lasses, we also had the fish wives um, and everyone contributed to the family budget. So talked about the fisher lasses working in groups of threes. Um, the fisher wives, they would actually go and work in groups of about 10. One of them would go and buy the fish at the harbor. Well, not, yeah, fish at the fish market they'd divvy it up between them and then they all had their own kind of route or area where they went and sold their fish so um and one of the big harbors in scotland um and fish markets was in edinburgh in new haven um and the fishwives there you know they divvy it up and then one of them might go into the posh part of edinburgh one of them might actually go out as far as dunbar which is several miles away and they would actually walk carrying the fish in the baskets on their backs. Um, and the weight of this, um, we did a bit of research because our current temporary exhibition is about fishwives. And we think that they carried about 50 kilograms on their backs, which seems crazy. But some of the articles actually said up to 80, which I think that can't be possible. So like, you know, choose what you want was it 50 was it 80 but we, we think it was probably around 50 kilograms that they were carrying on their back another thing that they would do for their income to supplement it was to do knitting which is why i've got these lovely ladies here who are sitting around posing for this photo while knitting knitting was a big part of this culture um for the fisher lasses for the fisher wives any moment that they could they'd be knitting um they had these belts that were called whiskers which they tie around and their needles would sit their little holes for the needles to sit in their belt so uh, one of our volunteers actually told me that he remembers his grandmother knitting while cooking you know they would do it any bit of spare time they had they would do it and some of these knitted garments would stay in the family but they'd also sell them as well to make a bit of extra money to come in um so yeah it was quite quite a big part and so it was a big family business. Everyone was involved. So I've just mentioned the knitting. Um, Gansies, I mentioned previously, were the jumpers that were worn by the fishermen and they would be made by family members. They were knitted in unoiled soft, uh, like usually dark brown six or five ply wool with apparently a 14 size needle. Um, and this would make it a firm, close knitted fabric. So it was practically wind and waterproof. Um, and the men wouldn't necessarily actually clean their gansies. They would have a couple of gansies. But while they were fishing, the oil from the fish would get onto the clothes and it would make it even more naturally weatherproof. So it might sound, sound a bit stinky <laughs> to us having like a really greasy jumper on but it was actually an extra bit of protection for them while they were out at sea there is a tradition that um you can actually identify a drowned man from his gansey because the patterns were so different and so regional but i'm not sure if that's actually the case but there was definitely a regional variation into what patterns there were and again these patterns were passed on verbally um from mother to daughter so there was this tradition of just handing it down and also copying other people's patterns. Some girls might, oh, I really like that Gansy jumper and they just look at it and they could figure out how to do it. And I think that's a bit of a skill that we've kind of probably lost with handicrafts nowadays. Um, I wish I was that good at knitting that I could just look at a jumper and then figure out how to, how to make the pattern. Maybe one day when I get a bit more experience. 
So I talked about how the fisher lasses were away from home and the fishermen as well. So religion was a big part of their community. Um, and there were missions set up for fisher folk for when they were moving around the country. Um, within these missions, they had female kind of church workers that were known as Bible women, and they would support um, the fisher lasses. They would also act as nurses if they cut themselves or hurt them, actually just provide medical care, as well as kind of pastoral support. And they also act as a bit of a social club as well. So these were places where these were places where um, they would basically socialize with other fishermen and fisher lasses. So I said earlier they were like a really close knit community, and while they were away, people would send postcards back to their family to be like, "How are we going? Hang on. Oh, we've had a really, really bad, um, and what's happening?" Um, so I've got an example here um, of a postcard that says, Dear Margaret, received your postcard. Glad to see that you are well. All the girl girls will be in Yarmouth now. We have very cold weather here. I think mother is writing to you tonight. Very busy. Love to you all. So I think it's like just an anecdote of kind of like the kind of messages that they'd be sending to each other. So nowadays we're so used to Instagram and Twitter and everything. And it's like, well, this is the way people used to stay in touch. It's very different from today. So when it came to their hard earned money, um, they sometimes spent these on gifts to send back home. Um, so a lot of the fishermen's cottage and our fisherman cottage here at the museum, the, there are shelves of lots of crockery like saying, this is a souvenir from Great Yarmouth, this is a souvenir from Lowestoft. Um, and sometimes they would even get them personalised to the family member that they were giving it to. Um, or they might buy something really nice as a wedding gift as well. So fishing, like I said, was a family effort. It was also a community effort. And the families did band together to buy and operate the boats. And everyone was involved in the preparing the gear, maintaining the gear, as we can see in this picture here um, from Buckhaven, which is just down the road from here. Um, they're all working together, doing different activities associated with fishing in Fife. Um, this photo has been posed. You know, the photographer has asked them to stand in a certain way so that we can see all the different aspects. So we've got um, on the left, the woman is knitting. We've got the woman who's uh, got some muscles that she's obviously taking out so she, that her husband can then bait the hook at the other end. So even though this photo is staged, it still tells the story of how this was a family business and very much a part of the community. Um, and just to reiterate, the woman was in charge of the money. It wasn't the men. So um, that's kind of it for me. Um, I hope you've enjoyed kind of my whistle stop tour of like who we are at the Scottish Fisheries Museum in Anstruther um, and that fishing has been such a part of the lives here for over 700 years. I know you're in the States, but you know, if you get the opportunity to come over and visit us, we would absolutely love to see you. And thank you very much for having me speak today. Thank you very much. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, we have a few questions from our guests. And the first one is from Bob. He says, wonderful museum. Thanks for letting us visit, in quotations. Can you explain the rig of Reaper? Her masts are stepped at different rakes. And then yeah. after that question, there's a few more in the same pair. Okay. Um, so, like I said, I'm pretty new in post, so I don't know everything, but I know there was something in my notes, so give me a second, I'll just look back over and see. Um, so, it is first class sailing lugger with a vertical stem and stern. I hope that Fantastic. answers the question. <laughs> Awesome. Um, the next question, still from Bob, is does the museum take visitors aboard the working vessels? 
So the Reaper is open in the summer um, because it's moored directly across the street from oh. us at the museum. Um, we can only open it in the summer just because of the weather and also because it's the ball for doing it. If we did it in the winter, it would be too cold because we are in Scotland and it is very chilly up here. Um, but yeah, in the summer, people get the opportunity to go on board um, as long as it's me um, at one of the fairgrounds because um, it does occasionally sail out to go to other harbours. Fantastic. Um, how large were fishing vessels that were built at the museum site in your boat shop? Okay, so where we are, um, they also had a site across the road from the museum. So if they were building something that was a bit larger, it actually was um, outside the space. So I'm not sure what the largest size was built, but I think I said the Zulu was 70 long. Um, and if it was anything that was like that big, it would be done outside in the space. Uh, we have actually got the big double doors um, ah. in the kind of boat building yards. So there were some boats that could be built in the space, but I honestly don't actually know. I need to find that out for my next talk so I can tell everybody. Fantastic. Wonderful. Um, with buildings so old, the museum must be, must need to work closely with historic Scotland. Has it been difficult modifying listed buildings or adding new construction units? The museum has grown, especially uh, listed buildings or adding new construction units as the museum has grown, especially to accommodate vessels in your collection. So most of the historic buildings, the external area, the external facade of the buildings has stayed the same. Um, I'm not sure at what point things happened, because like I said, I'm relatively new and the museum's been here since the 60s. So it's quite a long story in itself. But the exterior stayed the same. And we have a one way route that goes around the interior. So I I'm, I'm think with it being developed in the 60s, it might have been a bit easier back then uh -huh. to do things than it is now because nowadays I, I i know i worked for another organization where it's like trying to do something it was you sometimes felt like it's a brick wall because you couldn't get anywhere um but i think things were probably a bit more relaxed when we first opened um but obviously when we've added spaces i don't think we've had any big issues um so the zulu gallery where the research is um that space was built around it mm -hmm. so that was a slightly empty space so there wasn't an issue with that because we were basically building within a space that there wasn't something before so that made things a bit easier um and the boatyard we have a one-way system going around that but because of the way the space is i don't think there were any issues over planning permission to kind of get that done but that would be really a question for my my manager Linda she's been here for 20 years and she knows everything um but unfortunately she wasn't available to come and talk to you guys today so I'm sorry I might not be answering everyone's questions very well she knows so much more than me that's perfectly okay our next question is where do most of your visitors come from and how do they find you how long a drive by road are you from Edinburgh or Stirling Castle? Okay, so I actually live in West Lothian, which is about, I'm, I'm about 20 minutes out from Edinburgh, and it takes me about an hour, 20 minutes to get here okay. um, from there. So it's probably a bit longer from Edinburgh. Um, our visitors are a mix. Um, we have a lot of international visitors. Um, I'm not entirely sure how people find out about us, but um, we had some people from the Netherlands the other day. We have people from Spain. We have people from all over the world. Um, but we also have a lot of people who are recommended by word of mouth as well. Yeah. So there was a couple that was in yesterday that they were over and they were like, oh, yeah, our friend told us we had to come here because they told us you were amazing and you are amazing. And it's like, oh, it's so, it's so nice to hear that word of mouth is getting out considering we look so small from the outside. 
Mm -hmm. um, you would have seen from the slide with the harbour, it's like we've got the white building, we've got the brown building, we look quite, we, we don't really catch your eye. But um, I was trying to look for the picture that we have because we've got a picture that's a bird's eye view of showing you what the buildings are and we are quite a big site. But um, yeah, visitors come from all over. The one thing we do struggle with is trying to get local visitors to keep repeat visiting. Uh, so we seem to be doing really well for like the tourist season and from people out with the area. But um, one of the things I'm trying to do is to get local families to keep coming back to see our friendly cat Kipper, you know. So that's, that that's, that's the one thing we do struggle on is local people. Um, mm -hmm. I would say our visitor numbers are almost back to pre-COVID levels. So um, we are recovering quite well number wise um, for general museum visits. So. Fantastic. That a little bit answers the next question, next question, which is, do other museums in your region work in cooperation and refer visitors? Um, Bob is on our board and he's always wondering how to best improve visitorship. Well, I think I so said we have different kind of partnerships. So one of mm -hmm. our things that we're involved in in Scotland at national level um, is the Industrial Museum Scotland Network. Um, and that's a group of museums across Scotland that have an industrial focus. And we're always kind of supporting each other and cross-promoting each other. Um, locally within Fife, um, we have a local museum forum, which mm -hmm. is all the museums in Fife get together um, like once a month or every two months. Um, and we try to apply for funding to do different things. Um, so we had like a knowledge share event um, last year, which was really useful, uh, bringing people from different areas within each museum together. So whether you were learning or collecting, we got together to get to share what we know and how we do things and brainstorm. So we do have support through the forum as well. Um, so their sites also kind of help promote us. Um, and also we are a national museum, so we do have that support from Scottish government as well. We don't get as much of support as some of the other national museums in Scotland do. And that is something that we're trying to advocate for, that it's like, well, we're a national museum too. But yeah, we've got some really, really good partnerships, both regionally and nationally, that kind of help spread the word. Fantastic. Our next, um, more of a comment than a question is from Phil and they say, make sure to use Google Street View after the presentation to drive virtually through the town and you can drag the li little figure to activate Street View and you can see it from the outside of the museum. Yeah, and um, if you have satellite view, you can actually see from the air and try and figure out what what's the museum what isn't because you'll see from the corner site it's all kind of connected so <laughs> have, a, have a guess of how how many buildings you think are actually the museum as well if you're on satellite view wonderful um next question is from donna and they say what did they say instead of salmon for the uh superstition oh yeah i give me a sec so for salmon they called it redfish Oh, cool. Interesting. Okay. Um, next one uh, is from Kevin and just says, thank you and well done. Uh, best to you in the Marzium. Uh, and thank you, Kevin. <laughs> then we also have a few more thank yous. Bob says, thank you. Phil says, thank you. And Liz says, fabulous history and presentation. Need to plan a Scotland trip soon. Yeah, well, you'd be very welcome. We've also All got right. a golf museum down the road from us if you if you like golf as well. I would also like, like to... Food and leisure. I would like to point out that Abigail is taking a trip to Scotland in a few weeks. Oh, brilliant. So, I'll no pressure, Abigail. <laughs> Where uh... are you going? Sorry. I know we're no, it's okay. Uh, we fly into Edinburgh and then we're going up to Aberdeen. Oh, so we're bypassing we're not bypassing we're going by you guys so we're hoping yeah. to stop by um yeah. the coastal route is really nice to drive as long as the weather's nice absolutely I'll wonderful i'll pray for good weather for you fingers crossed all right thank you very very much that brings right. an end to our lecture and thank you julia for joining us today and we are looking forward to 
future talks. And thank you to everyone who's here and to everybody everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.